everyone, and good morning. Thank you for joining us at this panel where we'll be focusing on the future readiness of SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises. I am delighted to be joined today by three very uh, interesting and uh, wonderfully strongly engaging in future readiness uh, entrepreneurs. Stanislas Bouclet, the founder and chief executive officer of the Pelo IT Group. Uh, Elizabeth Rossiello, the chief executive officer and founder of AZA Finance. And finally, Akshay Shah, the group executive director of SELA Africa. And today we are going to be discussing sort of the attributes that contribute to this idea of future readiness for SMEs, and specifically looking at ideas of growth of different forms of sustainable impact, so economic, social, and environmental, and also looking at the importance of adaptive capacity. This work is building on a recent report that we have been working on as partners with the World Economic Forum, focusing on the impact of these attributes towards creating the future readiness of SMEs, and specifically looking at how important these are in terms of the context of sustainable development. Uh, oftentimes, SMEs are not given the attention or importance uh, relative to their weight within the economy and society, and are often overlooked. Therefore, we think that it is absolutely important that we're engaging with these entrepreneurs and discussing ways in which we can look forward uh, towards creating stronger future readiness for many of these organizations. And specifically, we're interested in discussing the challenges and also the opportunities that are presented within this framework. Um, we would be very, very excited to hear today from the three entrepreneurs joining us. And I believe uh, we are ready to go. All right. Uh, Thank you again for being here today. Uh, the first of the questions that I would like to pose to our panel is that of how you've responded to the challenges that we've recently seen. So I'm specifically thinking of things like the recent COVID pandemic, which I'm aware has impacted all of us quite substantially, and especially SMEs, um, potentially also looking at things like the climate crisis, which we're aware is slightly more of a longer term impact, but will undoubtedly have also a strong uh, need to shift how you are practicing within your organization. So Stanislas, um, I would love to hear from you first. Thank you, Ariel. Um, for sure, well, this kind of crisis, uh, are, from my point of view, uh, always a, uh, an history accelerator. And I think that's a good news. Uh, at the business level uh, and for companies, it has been, uh, I think, a really uh, wake up call. Clients, employees, uh, communities, market, and more and more conscious about those issues. And company will have to uh, shift fast. Uh, at Palo IT, in my company, we are fully dedicated to the tech innovation and the business transformation. And the first step for us was really taking a hard look to our current business model, mm -hmm. our value proposition, and stepping up to be an engine for the for the for the this change. So it was a good moment to do and stop to talking, uh, to talk. So sustainability is not uh, is not really uh, a target anymore. It's not enough. We can't get back with uh, what we have already destroyed, but we can generate something new. So to transform uh, our business, uh, we develop an internet transformation program called Red Genesis. The purpose of this pro program is uh, one, uh, first, it's really to insufflate a new mindset within the company, explain the company vision and the target, the long-term strategy, align the corporate values, develop consciousness leadership, uh, reshape a uh, new governance model and transparent with more transparency and uh, accountability. The second was to revamp our value proposition and to augment uh, with uh, impact uh, the technologies and impact businesses how we can uh, propose a new offer on the market. And the third was really to in integrate a new ecosystem globally and locally in order to uh, propose uh, added and augmented value. So um, we face also during this, uh, this period we say a new human resource challenges. Uh, it was um, a period to uh, to reinvent the work model to be more efficient, to improve a better life work balance and opportunity to accelerate the adoption of uh, the learning flat and agile organization model. And finally, I will say uh, it's uh, very uh, important to 
to have an authentic, transparent, humble, and continuous uh, communication, which is definitely key if you want uh, to that your teams embrace uh, this massive change. Okay, thank you. It certainly sounds like you have looked at the whole ecosystem in terms of how you are being able to move your organization fuel forward and keep it properly future ready. Yeah, for sure, the ecosystem is very important, and it's important to to, to start to map it. Uh, and there's plenty way to to identify uh, your ecosystem. Uh, so from a school uh, forward thinker, partners, clients, and so on. But uh, it's also uh, uh, to, um, to to embody some some core values to share with your ecosystem and to uh, try to figure out how you you are going to to build a, a new added value a new model for for to to have a, an impact as as your own level because we we are still SMEs so small companies but uh, we we can act uh, locally and progressively also globally through this kind of event obviously. Wonderful. And I know your organization is B uh, certified, so we'll get back to that slightly later. Uh, Elizabeth, I'd love to hear from you now, speaking to what you've experienced and sort of how you've navigated your SME through all of the sort of recent challenges and upcoming ones. Well, thanks so much, Ariel. And I agree a lot with what Stanislaus said, but I think the difference for our company at ASA is that we're an eight-year-old company, a growth company, but at heart, we're startup culture. And not only are we a startup culture company, uh, even though we're no longer a startup, but we are one who has been based and focused and building in frontier markets. And what does that mean? That means that we've never had the luxury of a stable um, environment in a lot of ways. You know, we've dealt with flooding, we've dealt with election violence, we've dealt with violence, we've dealt with bombings across the street. You know, we've really dealt with everything that sent our team home. And so we've had to had a work from home strategy from day one. And, um, and, and also since we are an infrastructure for financial services across the African continent, and we're um, a competitor to a lot of very strong incumbents, the way that we win and the way that we've grown is being agile and lightweight. So it's in our DNA from the beginning. So we had a real advantage and I'd say a lot of fintechs globally, but especially those in frontier markets saw huge growth during the, the season of COVID, the first season and now the second season. And part of that, because our teams were so ready, we even had a, a petrol allowance to fuel generators in our Nigerian team. Um, at the ready, we were able to distribute mobile money to, to get internet back up. So within an hour, we were operating at full capacity while a lot of the brick and mortar banking institutions had their teams offline for months, months. And so, um, and also our management model is such that it's a hub base. So your manager could be on another continent, but we talk constantly via tools like Slack um, and Telegram. And we have those tools integrated into our, into our core systems. So we were very ready to service our clients. I think the biggest change for us came in our clients themselves. So a lot of our clients are corporates that work on across um, in and out of the African continent. And in some regions, of course, 55 countries, you can't generalize at all. But in some regions, um, it was very difficult to win the larger clients or the more traditional clients with the biggest market share because they had very strong physical relationships with their brick and mortar bankers to the point where they were starting to accept very manual processes as the norm. So uh, I told this anecdote before, but we have a customer in, in the Sahel who, who in, in goes into the office in Dakar and deposits a million dollars of cash. And this is not a non-compliant customer. This is a very large wholesale importer who is of the top tier business people in, in the country, but because the same day settlement system in the financial infrastructure across the Sahel and into the Umea zone in, the, in Francophone West Africa is so weak, they were not able to guarantee either T1 or T, even T3 settlement. So when they were, you know, the, the relationships were so strong prior to COVID because of the physical relationship of going into the bank, they would never have worked with a FinTech. <clears throat> 
the great equalizer. And then a lot of companies came to us and they saw how wildly more efficient our processes are and how instant settlement, instant reconciliation, reporting, you know, zero, zero error rate down from 20% manual entry error rate, great pricing, entire continent service. And they were, wow, they almost like their eyes had been blindfolded and they hadn't seen what was out there. And I think sometimes we see these incumbent relationships and business practices and even protectionist policies mm-hmm. kind of go away in what we call an emergency zone. And I think that's been very exciting for our challengers, um, such as the startups and the growth companies and, and the technology companies. Thank you for sharing your experience of this. It sounds like it was a combination of your team and being able to adapt so quickly and use the technologies that you both have at your disposal and sort of a growing adaptation to what we need to do in times of crisis that really have made it so that you've been able to move through this period. Looking forward to hearing more as we go on with the session. Finally, Akshay, I would love to hear from you about your experience with your organization, because I believe that you were able to really target some sort of key pain points that were brought up by the COVID pandemic through your work. Yeah, um, thank you, Ariel. So when the pandemic hit, uh, our first reaction was, um, how do we keep our our employees safe? We're a manufacturing company uh, that produces packaging in, in Kenya, Tanzania, and East Africa. Um, so the first thing was, you know, just up the whole safety levels in the company. Then the next thing was to change the way of managing from a sort of business as usual to a crisis management approach. Um, and, and, you know, to make sure that, you know, we are able to continue to supply uh, packaging for essential items because we largely do packaging for food and, and beverage uh, type of products uh, in East Africa. I think once those things were sorted out, we then started looking at, you know, what's happening in the community and and how can we help? So uh, 10% of our manufacturing capacity, we commit to, you know, making an impact in the communities. And our focus is around providing access to water, to sanitation, to hygiene, um, and also support jobs in the informal uh, economy. So part of that was looking at, you know, what's happening with hand washing. Um, you know, as, as the pandemic started to expand and everybody was asked to wear masks, keep social distance and wash hands, uh, many of the schools, low-income communities, slums, markets, they just didn't have those facilities. And there was a lot of companies putting out uh, these um, uh, water uh, uh, tanks or drums or something like that with a tap on it. But nobody was able to really provide a sustainable solution, as in, most of these communities operate in an area where water itself uh, is not available or it's not reliable. The grid doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we wanted to think a little bit beyond just simply putting, you know, a, a water tank um, and actually connect it to a reliable water supply. Mm-hmm. So, over the 2020, uh, we kept iterating and ultimately came up with a with a solution where. Uh, think of it as a smart water station um, that has a, a sensor uh, on top of the water station or on top of a 3,000 liter tank, and it keeps uh, a record or keeps track of how much water is inside. Um, we then uh, partnered with a company called Maramoja, uh, who developed um, uh, a mobile app uh, that you can use to to see how much water is in there. Uh, we then connected with water uh, bowsers or water truck operators. Uh, these are micro entrepreneurs um, who who can be called like like an Uber for water type of an idea uh, that they can come in and fill up water into that water station if there is no other source of water available. Um, and and we're we're now sort of thinking, okay, what next? You know, because hand washing clearly is going to be there. It's got, it's a it's a it's a problem that needs to be fixed. But many of these communities even don't have access to water for drinking, for cooking, you know, for sanitation. So the same solution that we put out there, we're, we're trying to see how can we upgrade it, how can we retrofit it so that it can be available to, to provide water for all the basic needs. Um, and for us, this is really important because if we're living in a healthy community, if we're operating in a healthy community, then we've got healthy consumers, you know, who then, you know, support our customers and then we ultimately grow together uh, as a as a as a community and as a business. 
That's excellent. And it sounds like you, in this instance, were able to sort of adapt fairly quickly to the changing circumstances, but also look for areas where you were able to create this sort of shared social and economic value, um, which is very much something that we're interested in within both the report that I've been engaged with, but also within the overall context of the UN SDGs. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. I would now like to move on to the second of the questions that I'd like to pose to the panel, which is more forward-looking. So in terms of where you're hoping to be creating sustainable forms of value in the future, where do you see yourself engaging as the leader of an SME within this context? Um, Stanislav, would you like to go first? And I believe if you'd like to, uh, your B Corps certification would be a wonderful entry point for this. Um, yes. I, for... <laughs> For sure, it's. Um, I think, uh, as we mentioned, it's a, it's a good moment. Uh, whether whether the, as a decision maker you are really an actor or you are a follower, and uh, for sure, we don't have uh, any more time to lose uh, as decision makers. Um, so at Palo, we use the B Corp certification uh, really to. Uh, as a framework to build our own transformation journey mm -hmm. and measure our maturity level. It's, uh, we, we continue uh, uh, measure continuously. Uh, and uh, in order also to take a more qualitative uh, approach uh, to our transformation, we have setting a numbers of OKRs tied to our corporate values uh, that we aim to meet uh, to uh, 2025. So the first one, well, it's, uh, it's to double the size of the company organically. Well, it's one objective, okay. The second, uh, it's uh, aligned with uh, one of our core values, which is uh, we care about the world and, uh, and to be a net zero carbon company uh, and also uh, helping our clients to shift towards uh, net zero through innovative tech uh, solutions. So it's uh, one of our uh, commitments and uh, it's one of the first steps. Uh, the second um, measure also, Kia, it's uh, really to continue the B Corp certification globally in all our new offices uh, across, uh, across the planet and, uh, and also measure uh, the level of maturity to improve the, our level of maturity uh, in uh, everything, in uh, all what we do. Um, another one, it's really to... Uh, uh, we are dedicated to uh, develop soft tech innovation, develop uh, software, innovative software, and we really uh, want to target that more than 50% of our revenue will be a project that will have a positive impact and serve the UN uh, SDGs. So that's a very uh, it's a, a strong commitment. Uh, we uh, we want also to transform ourselves to become uh, an happy company. That means that we want to uh, that uh, uh, more than ninety percent of our employees across the world declare that uh, they are happy in their job and, uh, and proud of what they do uh, and happy in their company. And uh, and the last uh, uh, OKR, it's uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, it's to train, uh, train 100% uh, of our employees, Palo One, uh, to understand uh, the different climate issues, uh, to uh, understand uh, with an ethical way the impact of technologies, um, also to, uh, to be conscious leader, uh, to, tra to be trained also as, uh, to, to, uh, to have uh, common diversity, equality, and inclusion uh, practices with uh, the company. So it's a massive shift, but it's also super exciting uh, for all our teams and our ecosystem. And uh, it's, uh, it's give you a, a great energy uh, within the company and, uh, and with our clients and uh, the whole ecosystem. So let's go do it. Sounds marvelous. And it sounds like this is very much more motivated by your core values and just actually seeing that implemented throughout your organization. Um, which is, it's great to hear someone both speaking to this, but also actively implementing it. So thank you for sharing. Uh, Elizabeth, I would love to hear from you now, speaking of sort of where you're seeing future value creation around social, environmental, or economic goals um, that are more sustainable in terms of how we're creating this future. 
So um, within our company, we do a lot of what we call feedback, training, and coaching. And I think speaking to add on to what Stanislaus said about, you know, changing the corporate culture, but then how do you keep that corporate culture? But we've sat, what we've seen in our company, which is surprising, I'm a very outspoken activist for diversity and leadership and not just um, in terms of gender, but of race and religion, of sexuality. We talk about this and this is not something that a lot of companies in our geography talk about. And um, what we find is that you know, we can hire managers who are very supportive of that. And then the second there's a revenue crisis or there's a cash crunch or a market closes or a regulatory change, all the culture and core values go out the window and everybody just panics. And what we've really seen, and it's great to speak about this when there's a downturn and COVID and everybody has time to think about how to restructure, but how do you keep it live and living through all the business cycles and all the seasons that every business goes through? And um, we we lead from the top on that, and I feel very passionately that it's not just a it's not just a, as we say in New York a, a, a fair weather fan. You don't just do it when a, when when things are going well. And I think that is much harder. Um, and so what we've decided to do is bring in outside coaching teams and all of our management and not just our senior manager, but our mid management, um, receives coaching and we do um, peer mentoring. So I, I mentor a. A level five below me, you know, uh, somebody who's entered the company just a year ago. And we do make time for these things. And it's not just, you know, nonsense or mushy stuff. These are my future managers. And it's very hard to find good people um, that can really speak to these new agile ways. You can go on LinkedIn, you can hire a recruiter, you can find somebody with 25 years experience that comes from an institutional investor. Good luck getting them to understand what agile methodology is and that we work on an engineering sprint cycle. And uh, we've tried it over and over again. You know, I've stopped listening to the investors or board that say, just hire my friend. Um, he'll come in and he's the adult in the room. I'm 40. I'm already an adult. So, we, you know, bringing in somebody that's had 30, 40 years of work experience with a completely different work mentality is just not sustainable. And maybe you find a few, but you're definitely not going to find all of your managers there. So you have to grow them from within. So how do you teach uh, the, the junior team and how do you teach the mid managers and how do you future proof them and, and get them to understand that, yes, this is all sounds great. And, you know, there's cute colored coffee chairs and, you know, a really exciting open working space, but what, how do you form resilience in, and how do you make sure you stick to those values and, you know, just run to what you've known or seen elsewhere in a, in a down crisis. And that takes, I think, constant diligence. And so we see also from our customers and our clients, you know, when they, when they first were introduced to the technology that we use, such as blockchain or, you know, digital banking or mobile money or all of these things, they were very, you know, cautious. And what we saw was this very interesting report from Deloitte that said, you know, when we started the company in 2013, the number of corporate treasurers willing to do a large treasury transaction on a digital interface was less than like I think 20% or something. And just four years later, that number had gone to over 75%. So the willingness and the need to, to be absorbed to these new business practices is, is dire. And how do we get these managers? How do we get these teams to stay that strong and, and not to just be lip service. And I think that it's a very tough struggle that you have to do 365 days. And I think self-reflection, coaching, um, measurements, not, not just having those OKRs like Stanislaus mentioned, but how do you teach your team to meet those OKRs and really achieve them? And that's something that takes work on every level. Great. Thank you very much for sharing that, Elizabeth. It sounds like you're really focused on making sure that you have sort of an internal culture that's able to support this and grow and also be more responsive to the challenges we're facing rather than necessarily using older practices from the challenges we previously faced. Um, so thank you for sharing. Actually, I would love to hear from you now, um, sort of talking about how your SME is focusing on um, creating sustainable value into the future. Yeah, I think I think the, um, the core thing is all about resilience. Uh, the future of SMEs, entrepreneurs, micro-entrepreneurs, is, is thinking about how can they become more resilient and how can the environment in which they operate become more resilient. And a lot of this means we can't depend on, on traditional sort of uh, large infrastructural approaches, for example, to deliver uh, water. Uh, we have to be much more agile. Um, we can't wait for you know, massive infrastructure projects to, to bring water to communities or, or bring sanitation. So we need to be thinking about 
what what's an off grid approach? What how do we leapfrog um, and and bring water, sanitation, uh, jobs, um, you know, hygiene? How do we bring all of that uh, to these communities and and not have them wait for another five, ten, twenty years? Um, so there needs to be a quick fix solution. Um, otherwise, which we're just gonna end up leaving these communities behind as the rest of the world moves on. So, so resilience is, is the key thing. And then, and then innovation to, to be able to come up with solutions that are a quick fix, that don't cost millions of, of dollars uh, or billions, you know, disrupting a lot of things. Um, they can be plugged in very quickly. And later on, you know, maybe after five years as, as the water grid or the sanitation grid is able to catch up, then fine, you know, then you, you redeploy this to another uh, area where people don't have access. So, so I think resilience is the key thing. And if SMEs don't have access to so some of the basic stuff, um, you know, as I mentioned, water, sanitation, hygiene, um, you know, uh, connectivity to the internet, to education, then, you know, how are they gonna, how are they gonna grow? Uh, what kind of work are they gonna be able to do? Even if they have opportunities, they won't be able to deliver. So, so I think it's all about um, uh, working between large large manufacturers or large corporates, and then the SMEs, kind of co-creating this space together to become resilient together. You know, and I think that's another important uh, element of what I feel is the future readiness of SMEs is that we we need to be thinking between large and small companies to to collaborate. Because small companies could be more better at doing certain things, uh, whereas large companies are better at other things. So how do you bring the the two together, uh, and and you know the sum of the parts becomes uh, better for the for the environment for the communities. Okay, great. Thank you very much for sharing that, Akshay. Um, in terms of where we are in our schedule today, I'm now going to be opening up the floor to any questions from anyone who is currently watching, and uh, be posing these questions to the channel. So it looks like the first question that we've received is actually building on what you just spoke of, Akshay. So um, we can either start with you or we can work our way through the panel. But it is a question specifically asking about sort of the um, commitments of large multinationals on net zero and how these large multinationals tend to have significantly more resources, access to technology and know-how uh, than smaller organizations. And this individual is asking if there are any areas in which any of the three of you believe you have more advantage uh, compared to these multinational corporations, uh, presumably in terms of reaching net zero commitments. Um, so actually, if you'd like to begin, otherwise, if anyone else has uh, some sort of strong opinion on this, we'd love to hear from you. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think I think the advantage we have is that we're, um, you know, as Elizabeth said, we're more agile. So mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to go through a huge approval process. Um, we can we can start making decisions uh, at the operational level and quickly implement and iterate. If it's not working, we can quickly uh, turn things around. Um, so in that sense, we could move faster. Uh, getting to net zero also means keeping an eye on, on um, you know, what's what's the latest sort of innovation and technologies that allow you to become uh, net zero. Uh, uh, South Africa is really focused on circular economy, uh, not just for the products and for our customers' uh, uh, products and packaging, but also how we run our own manufacturing business internally. So if we if we start applying the concepts of circular economy. Uh, into our own company and making sure that you know we have no footprint at all because uh, we're, we're we're recycling everything we're reusing everything we're minimizing our consumption I think all those decisions require a bit of agile thinking a bit of experimentation um, and I and I believe where we are uh, uh, probably I think we can move faster even though we might not have uh, you know billions of dollars of resources uh, but we definitely have been able to move faster. It almost sounds like what you're saying or implying is that South Africa's lack of resources uh, compared to an MNC might actually make it more agile and perhaps even more creative um, as one possible advantage of being an SME. Yeah, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So you, you've got to make do with what you have and do quickly. 
Excellent. Well, it sounds like those are skills that will definitely pan out well in the coming years, uh, especially with more impacts of climate change approaching. Uh, Elizabeth, Stanislaw, do either of you have any sort of strong opinions on this? And if not, we can move on to the next question. Oh, just a quick, you know, um, example of this. So, you know, we were looking to integrate into one of the largest uh, financial services providers in the world. And they told us they had a two year integration cycle, two years. Now in two years, our business could quintuple and has. So, I mean, um, and we're working with some providers, you know, a, a, a Guinean provider, an Egyptian provider that do an integration in a week. And of course, different levels, different scalability, but you can't have such arbitrage in the amount of time it takes to get a policy passed, approved, how many people are involved in the project management, when in the end, it's just an integration, which is, you know, an API, a few engineers, and should only be a few sprint cycle. So, I mean, what's the rust? What's that extra buffer? What's that? And, and you see it when you look around, I'm in London now, you look around at all these buildings filled with people. What are all these people doing? Very quickly, you get to these companies, which you know, the, the organization becomes so overwhelming. And I think that cut to efficiency, that cut to necessity is what I actually mentioned. And it really is a, a very large quantum. And you can always say that, you know, an SME is never going to be as, as compliant or as stable. And you, they use these adjectives to describe large companies, but in the end, they're just bigger. <laughs> and actually they can be just com just as compliant, just as innovative, just as efficient. So I think we need to get rid of these vocabulary words when we're thinking about who do we look to for examples of corporate policies and corporate business practices. Okay, great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, again, speaking to the importance of what SMEs can bring and just thinking about their size and their potential impact within the world. I think the future looks bright despite the challenges coming up. So thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question I actually have is specifically for Stanislas. Um, Stanislas, one of the members of the audience would like to know exactly what type of certification your company is using to benchmark its digital transformation process. Um, so we, at, at Palo, we, we have looked during about, uh, this program has started uh, five years ago, uh, our tr own transformation. Uh, we look at lot lot of different uh, certification framework and so on. To be frank, the only one that uh, I found quite uh, mature uh, was the B Corp, uh, and uh, which really go uh, very deeply uh, in terms of granularity, uh, regarding different uh, dimension in terms of governance, in terms of. Uh, what you put in place for your 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 employees, uh, how you build your communities, um, what uh, what are you doing, and how you measure the impact on the environment, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, what uh, and uh, and the more important, it's uh, what you develop at uh, on, and how you impact your customers. Um, so. Uh, so I, 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 we, we use BCOP as really a, a good framework. After, there is plenty of different, uh, uh, if you want to go deeper in terms of uh, uh, to, to, to have uh, some good uh, referential, uh, there, there is other framework, but I, I think the, 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 the better way, it's really... Uh, uh, understand uh, uh, what you what you try to target, and after to to build your own uh, your own path. Uh, there is not really uh, uh, other kind of framework. Uh, there is so many now uh, platform or solution to measure different uh, to the, the different aspects. But um, yeah, so it's what I uh, what we experimented. Um, for sure, we, we mentioned that uh, agile organization model mindset is uh, is key, uh, and uh, agile it's not only uh, uh, methodologies; it's 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 a mindset and it's good practices. So I, I, I see too many companies, uh, large large company or uh, SMEs. Who uh, try to embrace uh, agile practices and, uh, and, and governance, and uh, but really uh, they, they do uh, they do it, uh, which with what is really convenient for them. So and uh, and uh, and, uh, and this is not the way. Uh, the way is uh, 
you have definitely to embrace everything if you if you want it's not uh, if you want to move forward and 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 perhaps to emphasize what has been uh, said before uh, it's a right moment to leap forward it's a right moment to leap forward and to accelerate it's uh, is the right moment also to uh, not only uh, to target a carbon free or sustainable uh, business model but it's to 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 move forward and and really to target to be a life regenerative business which uh, should be uh, your your long term vision but we have not uh, we have to go fast because uh, as we have seen uh, 10 years it's it's tomorrow so you you don't have three to four years to start. You, it's it's now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for speaking to that, Stanislas. Um, in terms of timescales, that actually leads us to the very last question we have before we move on to closing remarks. Um, we've just received a question that has asked how um, each of you have or have. Um, let me read this, uh, navigated the tensions between sort of the needs of the immediate present in your organization, and it sounds like survival, um, with that of sort of longer-term sustainability tensions. Um, so it sounds like sort of navigating the difference between what you need to do now in terms of survival and keeping your business strong, and then where you're aiming to go uh, strategically from a more sustainable perspective. So I think we have time for either one or two responses before we need to wrap. Sure. Um, I, I can um, try and uh, answer that. Great. That would be great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I think, I think understanding where we are today, where we need to go, um, is really about getting different perspectives. Um, you know, if we've been operating in a certain um, business model, mental model, and suddenly the whole world has changed, we need to start looking at, you know, uh, getting, getting perspectives from other entrepreneurs. Um, and, and making those connections, you know, learning from other people's experiences. Um, as, as you know, I, uh, there are a number of sort of these uh, entrepreneur organizations around the world. Uh, I, I belong to a, one of them called the EO Network, the Entrepreneurs Organization Network. Um, it's a, it's a, and, and, the, and the beauty of it is when, when the pandemic hit, we could all learn from each other to figure out how are we uh, uh, preparing, how are we pivoting? Um, and then now, um, as we look forward, again, we go, go back to these, uh, to these networks, to these peers uh, of other entrepreneurs and, and learn from them to figure out what different perspectives are they seeing that I'm not seeing. So the key is, I think, don't get blindsided by sort of, you know, being in your own silo, thinking about it yourself or with your board or your management. Uh, there's thousands of entrepreneurs out there one looking at the same problem, trying to operate in the same environment and, and learning from each other's experiences and, and failures and successes, I think is the key to moving forward. Okay, great. Thank you. It's, it sounds like you're almost speaking to the importance of these networks you have and your ability to rely on them and engage with these other founders through those networks. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I think we have time for one more answer. If Stanislaw or Elizabeth, you have any sort of last remarks on this, and then I think we'll be wrapping up fairly soon. But perhaps to add what has been already uh, said, uh, to add something, uh, and it's more about uh, yes, your uh, to to build resilient model. Um, I think also uh, financial independence and uh, auton autonomous uh, capital allocation is quite important because when you are under pressure on your market and you have some shareholders within your organization, uh, within your board, who are not aligned with your vision and, uh, and, uh, and your objective, mm -hmm. that's a huge problem. So, and, uh, and I think that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs face this uh, concern during the pandemic. I fully agree with uh, what uh, has been said also before. Uh, one other thing is to build distributed models. That means that perhaps not to be uh, totally a focus on one market, one sector, uh, one culture. Uh, even if you are a semis, uh, to build, uh, to be multi-market, multi-sector, multicultural, it's uh, it's really a, a key aspect for 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 your for your growth or, or for your impact. 
And uh, you can be really uh, small enough uh, to care and big enough to deliver uh, globally when you are uh, small or uh, an SME. So it's, uh, we said, the two main uh, other aspects that I, I could share also. Okay. Thank you very much for, for highlighting those. It seems that from our conversation today, we've been able to hear very much about the importance of sort of networks and agility, um, of being able to connect with other entrepreneurs in terms of business models, having that agile ability to shift to changing circumstances and talking about the need for having a very strong orientation and working with core values within your team and sort of finally touching a little bit on governance aspects, which are certainly critical from a more academic perspective, um, but are definitely coming up in terms of how we're understanding how to respond um, from regulatory aspects as well. So for the very final remarks for this session, I it is my pleasure and privilege to turn it over to Francisco Betty, the head of the Future of Advanced Marketing and a member of the Executive Committee for the World Economic Forum. Francisco? Thank you, Ariel, for the great conversation today, and thank you to all of our panelists for their inspiring remarks. As we hear from most of you, small and medium-sized enterprises are the backbone, backbone of our economies, representing up to 98% of companies in some sectors, such as manufacturing, which is the one I lead here at the World Economic Forum, and actually representing 70% of employment worldwide. While SMEs are the most at risk within the context of the fourth industrial revolution and some of the latest disruptions related to COVID-19, it is clear that they can also play the major role when it comes to boosting economic growth in a sustainable and inclusive way in, partic in particular. However, to succeed and be active drivers of change, SMEs need to be able to adapt and develop new strategies, build resilience, and new capabilities. And through our work on the future of manufacturing, what we have observed is that to be able to improve their future readiness, SMEs can focus on two main areas. The first one is technology adoption, the ability to transform their processes, operating business models so through force industrial revolution technologies. And that's where collaborations with governments, with MNCs and other key players can play the major role. And with that, SMEs can be active drivers of innovation across multiple sectors. The second angle is the investment uh, on people, upskilling, reskilling, and giving, giving their workers the ability to be able to cope with the pace at which technology is evolving. And I think that the very good news is that by developing these new capabilities, uh, SMEs can have a clear and develop a clear competitive advantage enabling disruptive innovation. They can be among the quickest, the most agile to adapt in an increasingly complex environment and be able to respond to customer needs very often faster than larger companies. And finally, they can be clear champions when it comes to implementation of sustainable uh, strategies and practices. Through our work, and I'm, I'm getting to the end, our, and especially our work on future readiness for SMEs, but also other initiatives, such as the Global Smart Readiness Index, we are committed the world supporting SMEs and helping build the public, private, multi-stakeholder partnerships that will help them thrive, thrive in this new global environment. And with that, let me thank you once again, Ariel, our panelists. Thank you for a great conversation today and for joining us. And we look forward to staying in touch throughout the SDI 21 program. Thank you.